Lesser Light by Matthew Draper. Chapter Twenty Four. New Year's Day, one year later. There was powdery snow on the ground, piling up against the gravestones, where gusts of wind had formed mounds. It was New Year's Day, a full year after the wedding, and we were gathering at Oscar's grave to pay our respects. Lizzie arrived first, wearing an oversized cloak in dark green, and hauling a wicker picnic basket, which she set down beside the headstone. Crouching, she lifted out a bouquet of flowers: red rose hips, punctuated white lilies, green eucalyptus, and the brown of pine cones. Winter personified. She also freed a bottle of prosecco from the basket and balanced six tall stem glasses beside her on the hard ground. She buried the base of the bottle into a pile of snow as a makeshift cooler. Following her clash with Morgan at the wedding, Lizzie had made good on her promise to report his whole organisation to the charity commission. An investigation was ongoing, but we knew it would not necessarily prevent him from rebranding. Some people will always present dangerous teaching to congregations. All we could do was make others more aware of it and look out for one another. Speaking of people who look out for one another. The gate to the cemetery creaked open, announcing the arrival of an upright pushchair and two proud parents. Jeremy trundled the pram down the uneven path between headstones towards the location where Lizzie stood waving. Christine leant close to his ear to whisper something and let out a bark of a laugh, which echoed around the graveyard. The two of them were closer than ever. After Jeremy had shared his fear of carrying the shared trauma of the St Michael's era into their baby's life, Christine had been able to breathe a sigh of relief. She had been filled with anxious energy in the days leading up to the wedding, unsure Jeremy was truly on board with starting a family so soon. Once Jeremy had been forced to open up about the worry the past would overshadow their future, they had been able to speak openly. Their mini honeymoon to Oban had been accompanied with long dinners discussing, celebrating, and mourning the past. Christine, who usually disguised her own fears with a bright and bubbly public face, had been able to openly mourn Oscar's passing and the impact it had on her at the time. Jeremy had lain pressed against her, their hands clasped for nights of tears throughout the first few months of their married life. But after a time, she had begun to feel genuine joy in small moments again, along with a genuine sadness from the past. Jeremy parked the pram so that Christine could undo the straps to lift baby Oscar out. He looked tiny inside a puffy baby coat, his face half hidden under a faux fur-lined hood, his mittens poking out of chunky sleeves. Christine cradled him gently in her arms before attempting to hand him over. Say hello to Auntie Lizzie. Auntie Lizzie was not the most baby-friendly person, so was more than happy to quickly pass the bouncing baby across to Rocco and I, who had snuck up from the other side of the gardens. Rocco held baby Oscar while I hugged Jeremy, Christine, and Lizzie. Jeremy was gleaming, and I hear congratulations are in order for you two. Oh yes! Lizzie grabbed both our hands to look at the rings. Careful not to disturb the baby Rocco was holding, hugged to his chest. We had not, subject to popular opinion, gotten engaged, and absolutely did not wish to recreate last year's winter wedding. Nevertheless, we had bought gold bands, and I had changed my last name to match Rocco's family name. I had chosen to set my biological family down in the past, and decided to embrace village life, and not to shut everyone out. I continued to talk about queer history with people who might like it or hate it. They were entitled to their own opinions. I was just happy to share something I was passionate about with the people in my new community. 
Rocco had told his mums and dad he no longer wanted to go by Richard, but would go by Rocco full time. He described himself as gender full and was on a journey of figuring out his own gender queer identity. Unlike my parents when I came out, Rocco's mums and dad had listened and understood the ways he presented himself to the world outside of set boundaries. In a show of support, Brenda and Jennifer had even made a series of pronoun-shaped ornaments for their website's Christmas sales that year. He, him, she, her, they, them, he, they, e, em. All 3D printed in gaudy colours, their usual brand. Maybe capitalising out of queerness was a form of celebration for them. Rocco's dad had switched to using his preferred name with the kind of ease which comes from a warm heart. In Rocco, I had found a safety rope. He understood on some days I would be unreachable, sunk into memories of my family or extraordinary experiences at St. Michael's. Sometimes I could not distinguish between what was real and what was not. But once I emerged from my funk, I was able to talk about it, and Rocco was always waiting for me bringing me soup when I could not get out of bed. Plus, I always had scrumples curled up on the quilt beside me. I did not have to earn my existence. I had allowed myself to relax into just existing for the time being. As Lizzie handed around glasses, filling them with bubbles which foamed up to the brim, I asked, Who is the sixth glass for? Dylan's in Thailand. Last year, Dylan had moved in with Erin, and the two of them had lived together for six blissful months before breaking up. He had decided to go travelling again. He felt his gap year was entirely missed, having devoted it to St Michael's. So this year, he was going backpacking around Asia. He had a lot of love to share with the world. Didn't I tell you? I invited... Sebastian. I felt a chill run up my spine beyond the cold. I turned around to find him stood a few metres away, as if waiting to be welcomed in. Ever since our experiences battling each other and our inner demons, it was as though we were still connected somehow. I sensed his hesitation, and stepped towards him, waving a hand to bring him closer. Sebastian had been seeing a proper counsellor, and had come away from religious studies for the rest of the year taking time to steady himself in the real world. While the others had, for the most part, forgotten exactly what occurred over Christmas, some kind of global warming phenomenon, Sebastian and I had met up a few times to discuss our memories of our moments on the moon and the past horrors from our own lives which had dragged us there. The specifics were already fading, but it helped to have someone to share them with until they were past. Trauma can reach out and take any one of us. Oscar was lost to the horrors of the abyss, and we could not go back and undo that. We gathered on New Year's Day to celebrate the kind of person he was. Joy-filled, warm, theatrical and kind. We all carried aspects of him with us. Acknowledging the past as real, that bad things happen to us, and we are affected by events in our lives and the way others treat us, gave us a power we did not realise we were missing before. It was not a power which could be branded or prayed into existence, but one we had found by living. To Oscar, Christine raised a glass. We all chinked our sparkling wines together and took a sip. We would continue to live and learn and love widely. Lesser Light is an online event. Head to lesserlight.blog to join in the comments section or share this story on Facebook, Twitter, Hive or your favourite social media platform. The Lesser Light paperback is available from lulu.com or other booksellers or you can download the ebook now. But remember, no spoilers until New Year's Day. 
The story is fictional, but if the elements about trauma, cults or recovery have affected you, you can find helplines at lesserlight.blog.